I'm Steven and this is a quick re-recording of my CGI 2025 talk on coordinate free circular splines. So there's a coordinate free circular spline running on the background, but let's be a little bit more specific of what we're talking about. So a circular spline through endpoints, which are the orange points here, is a smooth spline, a continuous spline that consists entirely out of circle and line segments. So circle segments were obvious, let me make a little line segment here. Um, and so our task is going to be, given these orange points, uh, calculate the entire blue spline. And typically this would be uh, something your high school math teacher would totally love because he would see all of these trigonometry functions uh, and coordinates. And that's typically the way that, that people approach this problem. Um, so it's riddled with coefficients. You have to explicitly find circle centers, arc orientations, circle coordinates, and so on and so on. So of course that's uh, 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 not how we're going to do it, but I did look up a simple example um, on Desmos that does this. Um, this one is by Fadashi 1725. So as you can see, there's a ton of cosine and sine calls, elaborate functions that are being defined so that circle centers can be explicitly calculated, after which we can figure out uh, counter or counterclockwise or clockwise orientations, and then more cosine, sines, and tangent calls to extract angles and uh, calculate all of these coordinates explicitly. That's in two dimensions. When you do it in three dimensions, it gets to be even more absurd. We're not going to do it that way. We will do it with geometric algebra, right? Now, of course, there is no geometric algebra that has a blade representation for circular arcs. So not even CGA has that. However, the orbit of a motor, a simple PGA rotor, which is a rotation or a translation, when you apply it on a point, that's exactly such a circular arc or line segment. And so that's how we will approach this problem. We will try to find the rotors Ri that rotate points Pi to Pi plus 1. So we want to find rotor R0 that rotates P0 to P1, R1 that rotates P1 to P2, and so on, right? Our entire spline is now going to be the set of all the points of the form, the ro uh, rotor i uh, exponentiated to the power between 0 and 1 uh, sandwiched with the point pi. So if you exponentiate the rotor to the power of 0, you get the identity. So first we leave point p0 in, in place, and then as we uh, uh, exponentiate our 0, we will find all of these blue points, and then all of these, and all of these, and so on. Uh, in order to construct these rotors, uh, let's begin by finding these circle centers, right? So this is a bit of a simplified situation. We are going to try to find R1. Assume we already have R0. There's an initial condition here, which is why we do it like that. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But so we are finding R1. And so the first observation that we are going to do is, um, if we want a smooth circular spline through point P1, then the circle here and the circle here, they need to be kissing. They need to be tangent circles exactly at a point P1. And one consequence of that is that the line that is formed by the previous center and our spline point must also contain the center of this circle. So let's call this line L0. That's this line, right? And we know something else uh, uh, about the center that we are looking for. It needs to be equally far from P1 and P2. It needs to be the radius of the circle away, obviously. So all of the points that are equally far of P1 and P2 are points on another line. Let's call that line L2. It's this line. And given these two lines, we could uh, approach the problem this way. We could say, oh, I have geometric algebra, so now it's very easy, right? Um, I will just uh, meet these two lines, normalize that, then I will measure this angle alpha that I need to rotate by constructing some more lines, taking a dot product and an R cosine to find this alpha, and then finally I could uh, find my rotor R1 by exponentiating using minus alpha over 2, times the center, and then I could need plus the rotor or minus the rotor, depending on which way of the circle we want to go. Now that's actually a little bit dirty, right? Extracting angles, that's really just polar coordinates, and I promised a coordinate-free solution. Now luckily, uh, the exponential function is not the only way uh, that we can create rotations in geometric algebra. Another way to do that is by taking the product of two reflections, right? In this two-dimensional case, those would be reflections in lines. And the two lines we would need in order to make that rotor, they would need to intersect at the center R1, and then they would produce a rotation with twice the angle between them, but wait a minute. 
if we take the lines we already found, then twice the angle between them is exactly the rotation we need. So instead of doing all of this, what we can do is just this. We can just take the product of these two lines and normalize it to find our rotor. Now that is the type of coordinate-free solution that we are looking for, right? And constructing these lines, of course, in geometric algebra is also going to be super easy. To find line L1, all we need to do is join R0 and P1, like that. And to find line L2, we can actually add both points, which would give us the point halfway. And then we can take the other product of this halfway point with the line between the two points to find L2. And that's also exactly how we'll do it. We sum the two points and we take the inner product with the line between the two points. So this gives us our formula. No trigonometry, no coordinates, no angles whatsoever. Very nice. However, I've been a little bit sloppy because of course our zero here is a rotor and we can't join a rotor, we have to join a point. But of course, luckily in uh, PGA, when you take the logarithm of a rotor, you get uh, in the 2D case the point at its center. So that's what we'll do. We will, instead of using our zero, we will use the logarithm of our zero. And I've also made it independent of the number of points here, but we can still read the same formula. In order to find R1, we have to add P1 and P2 together, gives us a point halfway. We have to dot that with the line between them, that gives us the L2 line. And then we have to multiply it with the logarithm of the previous rotor, which is the point here, joined with the point P1, right? So that's very nice. That's a beautiful mathematical formula. What does it look like in code? Well, it's not a lot more. I see that this uh, little example here is working. This was that initial condition. As soon as you pick that initial incoming direction, uh, all of the other circular uh, splines are uh, completely fixed. So what does it look like? Well, we create our two-dimensional PGA algebra. We have this little helper here to render the orbit of a motor on a point. Then we have our set of points and our seed point. And then here the actual work is being done. So we will first calculate line L1 by taking the logarithm that we see up here. We join it with the reverse of the first spline point. This is to get the uh, directions correct in uh, a dimension agnostic way. And then we calculate the second line by simply adding the two spline points and taking the inner product which we join between them to find our next rotor, which is just going to be the normalized product of those two lines. So fantastic, that gives us our example, but what about the three-dimensional case? And this is usually the point in the presentation where I ask the audience what we would need to change uh, in this formula uh, in order for this to work in three dimensions. And then usually there's a wise guy in the crowd that goes like, oh, well, you probably need a three-dimensional algebra. Well, that's, that's, that's a good remark, but is that enough? Well, let's find out. So as you can see, if we switch to three dimensions, we still get a circular arc. I might think I'm cheating now because of course all the points are still uh, in a plane here, um, but it actually fully works if we, if we move the points around in the third dimension, you can see that, that it all still uh, operates as expected. Um, even though this problem is uh, a lot more difficult in three dimensions, we did not all of our reasoning in two dimensions, but in three dimensions you actually have a whole family of uh, circular segments that can connect here, uh, which we can see by moving point P3 a little bit uh, around P2, that, that we can uh, get all of these uh, segments uh, extra, right? The problem is much more, more difficult in three dimensions. So that's quite spectacular and it doesn't actually stop at three dimensions, it works just as well in four dimensions. Right, that's interesting enough to take a closer look. So why does this work in three dimensions? Well, this is what we had in two dimensions. Uh, the sum of two points is a point, the join of two points is a line, and then in two dimensions, if you take the inner product between a point and a line, you're going to get a new line through the point and orthogonal through this original line. So indeed, that's our first factor, our first line. And then the logarithm of a rotor in two dimensions is going to be a point, a point at the center of the rotation. We join it with another point, and that indeed gives us another line in two dimensions. So we end up with the product of two lines, which indeed is a rotation. What happens in three dimensions? Well, most of it stays the same. So the sum of two points is still a point. The join of two points is still a line, but now the inner product is gonna give us a plane. It's gonna give us a plane through this point and orthogonal to this line. So our first factor has become a plane. And then here, the logarithm of the rotor is still a bivector, but that bivector now represents a line in three dimensions. The logarithm of a rotor is the line you are rotating around. 
And when you join a line and a point, you also get a plane. So in three dimensions, we have the product of two planes, which again creates the rotation that we were looking for. And a similar thing happens as we go up in dimension. So that is really super nice. We now have a formula that is entirely coordinate free. It is entirely trigonometry free. There is not a single cosine, sine or tangent call uh, to be seen here. Uh, it's entirely dimension agnostic. It works in any number of dimensions and I can actually explain it in 10 minutes, right? So I hope you enjoyed that and I will be putting all of the demos and a little write up in the comments of the video. Thank you.